Love D&D. Having discovered it regrettably late in my life, in the last two years in which I've been both a player and a dungeon master, the latter of which I much prefer, as you can see, it quickly became one of my most passionate hobbies and has already given me so many great experiences that I will fondly remember for many years. I could tell you about the time that one of my players ate a magic bean, then during a combat the next day, he shat out a lifelike stone statue of himself that insulted him and tried to get everyone to kill him. He loved it. Or the time that one of the party members became a coke addict. The character, not the player. Or the time we were playing a Christmas themed one shot and one of our characters got polymorphed into a giant mechanical Furby with the stat block of a T-Rex. Or the time we fought an actual giant feathered T-Rex that could teleport and shoot bees out of its mouth. Yeah, we noped out of there pretty quickly. Or the time my dim-witted barbarian tried to use his loincloth, the only thing he was wearing, as an Indiana Jones style counterweight. It didn't work, and all but one of us got eaten by a frogamoth. I could go on, but basically, I've seen a lot of weird shit, And I love it. And I'm hardly alone in this. Ever since Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson's creation came onto the scene in the 70s, Dungeons & Dragons pretty much defined the role-playing genre as we know it today, and has always exerted an enormous influence over the nerdy side of Western culture. It's inspired millions of players, writers, and storytellers. The amount of games, novels, TV shows, and movies that at least partly owe their existence to D&D is... Um... Well, let's roll for it. It's a lot. It also earned the wrath of a few pearl-clutching evangelicals, but that's a story for later. Since I publicly expressed an interest in D&D, more than a few people suggested I make a video about it, which is something I've wanted to do for a long time anyway, but how to make it fit with my channel? Oh yeah, there were movies about D&D, and they weren't very good. You are under arrest! I'm not just talking about this one, the one that's become notorious for how bad it is. There were other movies that made use of the D&D license and were officially approved by Wizards of the Coast. So I'm going to take a look at these movies in no particular order and see just how well they've managed to roll on their performance checks. Spoiler alert, not very well, because for the most part, they're worse than a pack of rust monsters. While I'm at it, I'm also going to cover Mazes and Monsters, a TV scare movie made at the height of the moral panic around D&D in the 80s. Because the fact that that was a thing will never not be funny to me. I have spells. So grab your dice and your character sheets, and let's go on an adventure. Now, how does it start again? I've never been good with beginnings. <laughs> Oh, yes. Fireball! Ah! By the gods. First up is 2008's Dragonlance, Dragons of Autumn Twilight, made by Commotion Pictures and distributed by Paramount in association with Wizards of the Coast. This was based on the first book in the Dragonlance Chronicles, set in the D&D campaign setting of the same name, with authors Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman assisting George Strayton in adapting the screenplay. Dragons of Autumn Twilight was actually based on the author's own D&D sessions, in which they played through the first of the official Dragonlance game modules. I haven't read these books or played any games in the setting, so I had no expectations going into this, but I do know people who have, and not a single fan of Dragonlance I talked to liked this film, and the response from fans online seems to be mostly negative. And it's really not hard to see why. The most obvious thing that stands out is the animation quality, so let's start there. Even played straight off the DVD, it's fairly low res and blurry. The animation style is pretty uninspired and boring, not much better than your average Saturday morning cartoon, and barely an improvement over the D&D cartoon that came out 25 years before. Not only the style, but also the execution is lacking. Sometimes expressions are way off. She's meant to be eagerly awaiting his approval, but what does that expression look like to you? And what's wrong with this image? And why does this spit look like... something else? The frame rate often drops considerably, I guess so that they could save money, but especially during the fight scenes, it looks horribly clunky. This is made worse by their attempt to combine the 2D animation with some 3D CGI, which is poorly rendered, looks primitive for its time, and doesn't complement the traditional animation. Aside from the gimmick of combining the two styles, I don't get what the point of this was, especially when they couldn't do it well. 
comparing this to the Iron Giant, which came out nine years earlier and did it far better, it really is a testament to Dragonlance's low budget, as are the effects which are occasionally placed on top of the animation, again with, uh, mixed results. It seems like most of the budget went towards the voice acting, because there's some big names and decent talent here, including 24's Kiefer Sutherland, Smallville's Michael Rosenbaum, you <laughs> Eurotrip's Michelle Trachtenberg, and Lucy Lawless, most famous for her role on The Simpsons. And some other TV show, I don't know. Most of the voice acting is decent, child actors notwithstanding. Yeah, you're it! Can't catch me! You're it! <laughs> ha ha! Hey, how come you're so short? Story of my life. Kiefer Sutherland's underutilized voice work is probably the highlight of the movie. If you have entered this wood with evil intentions, you will not live to see the moons rise. But when he reads out the spells, it's just hilarious. It's like he didn't take them seriously at all. Asked to Sarex in Rollin Kronawi. Except that apparently he did. He did a lot of research into his character and often worried about the pronunciation of magic spells, necessitating multiple takes of their castings. Kenneth Coran drove at his car. We did 20 ticks, and that was the best one. Often the dialogue doesn't match the mouth movements, which are already pretty simplistic. At times it felt like I was watching an anime. Sly, at least I'm not a half-breed. And then there's the story, which is dripping with plenty of cheese. I offered you a chance to work for the further glory of my queen, but you have denied her. And now you will pay with your lives! If it had been a Saturday morning cartoon, it might have been decent, but it's really not. The film very clearly suffered from having to condense the 450 page novel into a 90 minute movie. Large amounts of the story had to be cut out, which meant that the storytelling is simplistic and dull, and the narrative seems to take place in fast motion, even as the animation stutters at 4 frames per second. The pacing is awful. The film very often rushes forward and then grinds to a halt and then rushes forward again, making for a very disorienting experience. And based on what fans of the books have said, it seems like its characters got butchered by this adaptation. The condensed narrative and hurried pace means that they aren't given very much room for development, and what development there is, is very rushed. Which means that the characters who are kinda tropey anyway are made even more one-dimensional and unempathetic. And at the risk of pissing off a lot of Dragonlance fans, I have to point out that there's a lot of stereotypes on display here. The thoughtful but self-doubting party leader and conflicted half-elf who's torn between his human and elven halves, and whose surname is literally Half-Elven. The angry dwarf warrior who's stubborn as an ass and complains more than I do. The halfling rogue who's always jokey, f***s around and steals from party members. I didn't steal anything. Uh, oh, I mean, <laughs> let me check. Hey, Lorana gave me that ring. This? Oh, you must have dropped it back at the inn. You're lucky I picked it up. There's always one, isn't there? The gruff, valiant knight who's always saying things like, On my honor. The one woman, who's also the healer of the party, which I'm sure is purely a coincidence. Her stern, man of few words, white knight who's in love with her, and is also a racist. The edgy wizard who sacrificed his health for his magical powers and is clearly an asshole and will probably turn into a villain. The old man who tells stories and knows everything but is always forgetting things, and turns out to be a powerful wizard who's basically a DMPC who shows up as and when needed to get the players out of sticky situations. And of course, Big Titty Tavern Wenches. I like big it definitely feels like it was the author's first D&D adventure, when they were still young and unimaginative. In fact, there are a fair few elements that have been borrowed heavily from Tolkien and other fantasy writers. Too many to be a coincidence. Even back in 1984, critics were complaining about the novel's derivative nature, its stock characters and its cliches. And it does mean that the film doesn't do much to endear itself to modern viewers less tolerant of these overused tropes, or to those who have no knowledge of the source material such as myself, and it meant that I got really bored by the end. There's some references to the game that pulled me out of the movie and reminded me that I was watching a D&D product. No matter how powerful a wizard is, he's limited to the number of spells he can cast each day. It's like the movie started metagaming. But then there's also inconsistencies with how things work. For example, Raced says magic words when he casts spells. But when Fizban casts spells, he just says the name of the spell. Knock! 
Maybe first edition purists or fans of the books can offer some reason for this difference, but none is given here, so I'm just going to put it down to incompetence. Ultimately, it's unclear who the target audience for this film was, because if it was the book's established fanbase, then it really sh** the bed just like it sh** all over the material. No one over the age of 8 would get much enjoyment out of this, but its PG-13 rating and emphasis on violence and animated TNA means you couldn't run it on a Saturday morning, which means it's not in a position to make anyone happy. But maybe we can get some enjoyment out of it. So let's take a look. After a poorly animated intro sequence in which we see a bunch of dragons and their followers raiding and pillaging, we cut to a village occupied by goblins, about which Michelle Trachtenberg's tavern wench is remarkably unconcerned. With all these goblins around, I'm afraid this place isn't as festive as it used to be. The old wizard tells her a tale, which is the excuse for Since the Dawn of Time exposition. In fact, that's literally how he begins it, like a DM going over their 50-page setting bible that the players will neither remember nor care about. Since the Dawn of Time. But it sets the basic premise for the Dragonlance world of Kryn. Once upon a time, the evil dragon goddess Tachesis was defeated by the gods of light, especially the warrior god Paladine. Yeah, I, I know, it's very imaginative. But then people took the piss and prayed too many times, so the gods gave Kryn the exterminatus it deserved and abandoned it, taking their healing magic with them. And for the next 300 years, everything went to sh**. And now Tachesis has somehow returned. There's more blah blah and exposition, something about a staff and some discs. I'm sending my greatest warrior to guard the city, even if the staff reaches Saxeroth. They just had to focus in on her D20s, didn't they? Michael Rosenbaum's Tannis meets his dwarven friend Flint Fireforge on the road to a place called Solis. Tannis has been looking for proof that the gods have returned without success. He found no healing magic, which would have been evidence of this. Halt! No one is allowed to walk within the limits of Solace after dark. But it's not... it's not dark. So then there's a fight with the goblins, just like the start of every D&D campaign. It could only be more stereotypical if they started in a tavern. Which is the very next scene! Here they meet a bunch of other characters, Sturm, Caramon, and his brother Raced, as well as picking up the Kender Tasselhoff along the way. The only one who hasn't showed up is Kitiara, Caramon's sister and Tannis' love interest. I thought you boys would be thirsty. Little Tika Whalen, you grew up fast. And then they immediately emphasize this with some anime physics. The old man tells a story that sets off this religious nutter, so Lucy Lawless's character Goldmoon intervenes. The fanatic tries to take her staff, but Riverwind pushes him away and he falls into the fireplace. In order to put out the flames, or maybe because he's a sadist, Tasselhoff knocks him down with the staff, which miraculously heals him. Turns out this was the same staff that was mentioned earlier. The goblins want the staff, and the people don't want them to burn down the town, so the party end up running away from everyone. They eventually get away after some more laughably bad combat. Then they escape on a boat, and all the potential tension and drama this scene could have had is wasted through its sloppy execution. Bracelet, you have anything up your sleeve? More than you'll ever know. Asked to Sarex in Roland Kronawi. Good work, brother. Why didn't he do that earlier? What was he waiting for? Riverwind starts being racist towards Tannis, so PvP almost breaks out. But the party decides to put their differences aside and set out for the village of Hayden to find out more about the staff. During a short rest, it's revealed that Riverwind and Halfmoon are in love, but can't be together because they're from different social classes. But after only a few sentences are uttered, the story moves on to its next beat and shifts in tone again, as the party are approached by monks who turn out to be draconid warriors. So, after an even worse fight which shows just how badly the two animation styles don't work together, Sturm lies dying and no one mentions using the staff, and it takes about 20 seconds for Goldmoon to think to use it on him. Why? Are they all suffering from feeble mind? To escape the Draconids, the party runs into the Darkened Wood, where they eventually run into Spirits of the Dead. Because the DM was feeling guilty about that near death, after they mention they have the staff, they get taken to a peaceful glade where they find a hero's feast and the Forest Master, a unicorn that speaks like a text-to-speech robot. It's intended for good, to combat injury, illness, and disease. But in these times, it will also become a weapon 
against the very evil that seeks to banish it from the world. The Forest Master tells them to go to the city of Zaxaroth to recover the Discs of Misharkal, those discs mentioned earlier, which contain the truth about the gods and will help restore the people's faith in them. Where are we? The plains of Abomasinia. Our village lies to the east. No! What? How, how did you not see that while you were in the air? So yeah, their village has been destroyed by the Draconids, whose tracks lead to Zaxaroth. The wizard, who is definitely not evil, uses a friendship spell to enslave a passing dwarf to guide them through the city, where they find a hoard of treasure guarded by a sleeping black dragon, which sometimes looks blue. They find the discs as the dragon wakes up. Goldmoon breaks the staff in order to destroy it, but is herself destroyed in the process. Riverwind, being a racist, blames Tannis. And so does Tannis. But they find Goldmoon in a ruined temple, having been reborn as a proper cleric after her intense act of faith. They realise that they are unable to decipher the discs, so they head back to Solace to find someone who can. On the way, they get ambushed by the Draconids and taken prisoner, along with the other inhabitants of Solace. Can't let them have the discs. If they realise what they are... It'll be alright. I have cast a spell upon our belongings. Any who touch them face a hideous death, painfully devoured by the great worm Caterpillius. Yeah, definitely not evil. In the cage, they meet Tannis' elven cousin Galthanus, and the old guy from the inn, who reveals that his name is Fizban and tells them about the now long lost Dragon Lances, weapons with the power to destroy dragons. In case you were wondering about the name. Mishako, please heal this child, if it is her destiny. Thank you. It doesn't hurt anymore. Her injuries were too great. Well, I guess this god of light hates kids. You know what I say? F*** the children! The caravan gets attacked by elves and the party breaks free. Elves hate humans, of course, so they refuse to help them any further, but with a successful persuasion role, made at advantage with help from Galthanus, they are led to an elven city that's definitely not Lothlorien to meet the elven leader, who doesn't believe them until Fizban makes a successful intimidation check. So he tells them that Verminard is gathering an army to attack them, and asks the party to ferment a rebellion among Verminard's slaves in order to give the elves time to escape. Tannis wants to go alone, but the rest of the party insists on going with him, as does the old wizard and the tavern wench. Not that she adds anything to the party meta besides those plus two jugs. Tannis rejects his elven love interest, because of course that's a thing, because he thinks the elves will never accept them. Galthanus leads them on a secret route to Verminard's stronghold, where Goldmoon heals the leader of the slaves, who tells them that a dragon is keeping their children hostage, which is why they don't dare try to escape. In order to get past the guards, they adopt disguises and somehow manage to pass their group deception role. The old dragon guarding the children turns out to be half blind and insane, giving them advantage on their deception checks. They lead the people back to the secret tunnel, but the Draconids have found it. So Tannis is unsure what to do and starts doubting himself again. Wasn't it your faith in each other and in the gods of light that got you this far? Faith is your greatest weapon against Tachesis. Embrace it you'll become beacons of light to lead the slaves out of darkness. I mean, another fireball wouldn't go amiss. But instead they decide that the smart thing to do would be to try sneaking out the front gate where the entire draconid army has assembled. They fail their group stealth check and it very quickly goes tits up. Verminard arrives and starts burning people, so Tannis tricks the old dragon into attacking him, while Fizban uses a fireball to open the gate. Proving my point that Fireball is indeed the cause of, and solution to, all of life's problems. And what's that massive army doing all this time? Oh, there they are. Finally. Verminard starts f***ing them up. Because he's quite literally a cartoon villain, he waits to finish Tannis off, allowing the half-elf to demonstrate his newfound faith, which summons Paladine, who was actually the old man all along, of course, who then defeats Tachesis, causing Verminard to lose all his powers. Tachesis! Why have you abandoned me? The old dragon grapples the other red dragon and crashes them both into the mountain. I feel the need to show that one again. The rest of the draconid army runs away and Fizban is assumed lost after falling down that hole, just like in that other movie. <laughs> For sake. After which the slave leader reveals that he can read the discs. Sometime later, Goldmoon and Riverwind get married and everyone starts getting busy. 
despite their victory, Raced insists that they need to find the Dragon Lances. And in a shocking twist, right at the end, it's revealed that Kitiara is a High Lord of the Dragons! Da, da, da. Leaving so, so many things to be resolved in sequels that are never going to be made. Because although they were probably trying to establish a franchise of direct-to-DVD movies based on the books, the lack of funding, lack of imagination, and the squandering of its existing resources and potential means that what could have been godlike is instead an aborted fetus of monumental proportions. And the mostly negative reception the film received meant that plans for future instalments were abandoned. It seems like the studios didn't really care, sourcing the animations to an Indian company of questionable quality, and giving the film almost no marketing except for a single trailer that's one of the most mid-2000s trailers I've ever seen. Now, a handful of warriors must battle the forces of darkness in a struggle to save all they hold dear. There are rumours that another Dragonlance movie may be in the works, but until then, this is all that the fans have got, and I honestly feel bad for them. So yeah, this series is off to a great start, and it's only gonna get better. <laughs> gonna be finding dice everywhere for weeks now. Thanks for watching, folks. Once again, I gotta say a big thank you to all my lovely supporters on Patreon. You guys are awesome. If you like what I'm doing here and want to support my channel more directly, consider becoming a patron yourself. Subscribe for future content, including more bad D&D movies. Follow me on my social media if you feel like it, and I'll see you in the next one.